Okay, so as people file in, I will uh, reintroduce uh, Enertive Office Hours. That's what we're uh, doing today. Basically, um, Enertive Office Hours is, they're, they're webinars, but they're meant to be less boring. Um, we really, really encourage you to ask questions along the way. We don't necessarily have to do um, a presentation and then a Q&A at the end. If there are questions that I can answer as I'm going through, uh, I will stop and answer those. I, I, I uh, highly encourage you not to be shy um, to share your, your thoughts um, and, and uh, make this kind of more of an interactive discussion. Um, <clears throat> you'll, I think you're probably all familiar with Zoom, but there's there's both a chat and a Q&A section. You can use either one. Uh, personally, the Q&A is a little easier for me, but but either one works. Um, okay. Uh, I, I know people are still filing in. I Before I kind of launch into it, I want to provide a little background about why we chose this topic today. Um, in, in previous Enertive office hours, we've, we've talked about uh, topics tangentially related to technology. Maybe it's like, you know, setting science-based targets or getting, um, you know, like on-site operator and property manager buy-in into technology. Um, and the feedback that we got was, this is all really interesting, but like, what I'm, what the audience was struggling to understand is is actually how technology applies. And um, interestingly, we were seeing a lot of those questions come from uh, those who work in triple net leased portfolios, whether it's uh, industrial or or retail or, or maybe even some office, but but prim primarily industrial. So um, we kind of Come combine those those concepts um, specifically. You know, like how do we, you know, how is how are our peers deploying technology today? Uh, what does it look like? What problems is it solving, and and why are they doing it? So that's that's kind of the background for today. As I mentioned um, early on, definitely feel free to ask questions during the webinar. Um, I can stop and answer those on the fly. We don't have to wait for a Q&A at the end, although there, there will be one. Um, so with that, I, I really appreciate everyone joining. Um, it's, a, it's a cold day up here in the Northeast, but I hope, hope you're, uh, you're doing well wherever you're, you're calling in from. And with that, let's, let's get started. So triple net leased landlords have obviously um, historically been removed from the operations of the building and they've liked it that way. Um, it, was, it wasn't a bug, it was a feature of their investment philosophy to invest in properties where they don't have to get involved in the, the operations and maintenance, they don't have to pay the utilities, they don't have to worry about uh, things like insurance or taxes. Um, and they were they were kind of happy with with this setup. I, I, you know, obviously a lot of portfolios, triple net lease portfolios, have um, seen a lot of success, uh, especially in the last few years. Um, the problem is that you know the times they are changing, right? Um, so triple net leased landlords <clears throat> are under pressure new pressures that they've never really faced before. Um, primarily, those come in the form of um, emissions reporting. And um, we'll talk about why this is a challenge and, and exactly what we mean by this. Modern tenant <clears throat> requirements, specifically, you know, the, the tenant makeup um, in the average, you know, industrial asset is a lot different and their expectations are a lot different than um, even five, 10 years ago, right? The 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 rise of e-commerce, the sophistication of supply chains, all these factors have meant that, um, you know, these spaces have like more HVAC equipment, um, 
the the tenants have more expectations on the landlord in, in terms of um you know like a a digitized uh experience um and uh it, you know the the arm's length relationship is 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 being pulled the you know landlords are being pulled closer to to the operation because of that finally rising cost of capital i think this this affects every single business in some way or another uh we'll talk about <clears throat> exactly how this applies but the the bottom line is um you know in addition to making acquisitions and dispositions more difficult um the landlord who's ultimately responsible for replacing this equipment and and making capital investments into the property um they now have a bigger incentive to um make better decisions there if if possible so <clears throat> the 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 ability for landlords to kind of sit back and do what they've always done and and continue to be successful is is eroding because of these kind of macroeconomic changes. Um, worse, there are there are some structural challenges, right, for the for triple net leased owners. Um, because of that arm's length relationship, many just, you know, they they may not have on-site property managers at all um, or operators at all. And even if they do, the the tenant relationship um you know, they they might have one contact in accounting who pays the rent, right? Um, it's not as tight of a relationship as you might find in like a an office or a multifamily setting. So it's um, that it's a structural challenge that that has to be overcome. Um, the 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 second one is that there's no baseline data to justify a business case in investing in technology. So even if you can understand conceptually that, yeah, I need to make more data-driven decisions and like my process clearly has some holes or gaps, um, it's hard to calculate exactly the cost of those gaps just because um, so much is done uh, kind of manually in spreadsheets and, and based off, again, the last point here is, you know, workflows that were never designed to be right scaled or applied to technology. Uh, I heard a great quote recently that you know everyone says that assets are beautiful and unique snowflakes, but asset managers are also beautiful and unique snowflakes, and their processes um, were designed for their situation. You can't just take that process and put it, you know, layer it into technology and expect everything to, to run appropriately because it that's not what it was designed for. So these structural challenges are, you know, like A, kind of things have to change. B, it's it's hard to change. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not here to say there's a there's a a, a perfect silver bullet solution. Um, but I do want to present, and you know, this is why I talked about this in the beginning. This is this is the question that was being asked of us. Um, what are some practical applications of of technology to tackle these these solutions? So let's let's dive in there. Let's let's get into the the meat of the presentation here. Again, I want to reiterate: feel free to ask questions in the chat or the Q and A as I go through. All right. First thing: ESG reporting and um, you know, this means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, there are there are large uh, investment portfolios out there that have been on the forefront of ESG for a long time. They're still struggling with data gaps and and they're still trying to get their reporting uh, in order. There are also smaller landlords that have historically um, pulled from private capital that doesn't care about ESG at all. And they've never had to think about this, but maybe they just, you know, signed a JV with one of those bigger partners, or they need, they're scaling and they need to unlock more capital, or, you know, there's a variety of reasons why those who have historically not um, had to pay attention to this are, are starting to think about it and realizing how big of a, of a challenge it can be. Um, so, Many of you are going to be familiar with with Gress, but I want to I want to like 
set the stage here and make sure that everyone understands. Um, there are a lot, you know, when we say ESG reporting, there's like a alphabet soup of different reporting frameworks that organizations can report to. Uh, GRESB is the biggest one for real assets, real estate, primarily. Um, their footprint is enormous and it's growing. And if you're not aware of the requirements here or you haven't kind of started the journey, um, it's unlikely to be the the type of thing that you can ignore forever. Um, so it's it's uh, it's it's important to to kind of understand what it is and and how you score well in GRASP. Um, there are some metrics here just on like their their total footprint. So like eight point six trillion square feet <laughs> are currently reporting to GRASP on an annual basis. Um, if you're outside of that, you're you're if not already soon to be in the in the minority. Um, the really important thing to understand about Gresb is that currently they aren't really judging you on performance of the your data, right? They are judging you on data coverage. They're judging you on um, to what extent, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm primarily focusing on the, the E of the ESG um, landscape. But they're they're primarily judging portfolios on the extent to which they can um, report accurate, verifiable data um, about utility consumption and associated carbon emissions. Obviously, for triple net lease landlords who have tenants who pay the utility bills, getting this data is not easy, and that's why if you have you know, 30%, 40% data coverage in GRED, you're actually one of the leaders. So um, it's not too late to catch up. There's a, there's a lot of room to go, even for the leaders. And it's, it's one area in which um, firms are competing with each other uh, on the data coverage aspect. They're, we're not even talking about um, carbon reductions or uh, net zero improvements or anything like that. So let's focus on data coverage for, for triple net assets. I want to start with the conventional approach. This is going to be kind of a, a theme throughout, throughout the presentation, but um, the conventional approach that we see is property manager, you know, like ownership comes down, they say, we need this utility data. Property manager says, okay, we don't have it. Let's ask the tenants, right? So in some cases, the property manager on like a quarterly, maybe biannual, maybe annual basis, they ask for tenants to share their utility bills. Sometimes the tenant agrees and they provide their utility bills. Great. Um, utility bills are only the first step, right? Those, those, the data from those bills have to be extracted so often companies will hire consulting firms to kind of handle the, the data extraction and the submission to Energy Star, to GRESP, to these different reporting frameworks. Um, after that's done, and you know, the consultants are not, not super cheap. Um, after that's done, owner meets the reporting requirements, great. However, uh, probably more than half the time, the tenant says no, or ignores the request, um, in which case there's, you know, the property manager generally throws up their hands, right? Like this is not their core competency. It's not their core responsibility. They they often don't really have any incentive or, or care that much to get this data. So there's just gaps, right? If the, if the tenant is not cooperative, um, it generally doesn't work. Now, Many of you are probably familiar with the concept of shadow metering. The, the idea here is that a technology company will go in, install um, meters upstream from the tenant meters, capture the data directly, and provide that to landlords. So technology company installs the meters, get the data. That data can be... Um, 
you know, processed and automatically submitted to Energy Star to Grez, um, and and the owner meets the reporting requirements. It works, right? There, there's there's no issue here, um, except that some portfolios have found this cost prohibitive as a policy. Um, so installing meters while a very effective solution, um, you know, if you have a 50 million square foot portfolio and you look at the kind of capital costs of deploying metering for every single tenant in that in that portfolio, um, there might that capital might not be there, right? Especially with the the cost of capital today. So, what can we do? Um, there's now a more of a hybrid approach to capture this data in the uh, most cost-effective way possible. So, um, in this instance, a technology company request the utility data via an online portal. So instead of the property manager emailing tenants saying, can you send this data? There's a, a portal set up. The portal reminds tenants, hey, please upload your um, utility bills. Um, this portal is bifurcated. Uh, there are going to be assets that are that are in utility coverage areas that subscribe to something known as green button green button uh is a it's basically an api from utility companies that offer whole building data um to the landlord however often uh either you know by requirement or just for the landlord's peace of mind um they can't just request this data. They need a letter of authorization from the tenant. So basically, with this portal, if the if the asset is in a utility area that's covered by Green Button, the technology company offers the LOI, the L letter of authorization in lieu of re requesting the data. So it's basically um, through this portal, upload your data, upload your data, upload your data. Oh, by the way. If you don't want to do this process, if you just want this to be automated, sign this LOA and it, you won't have to hear from us again, right? So it's a pretty compelling um, strategy. In that scenario, maybe the tenant signs the LOA, the LOA is tracked by the technology company, the data is captured and it's automatically submitted. So owner meets the reporting requirements. That's a good scenario, right? Um, very low cost because it's just pure software. There's no need for hardware. The other alternative is the tenant is not in a in a green button covered utility. Um, maybe in either scenario, they don't sign the LOA, but they uh, or there there's no LOA to sign, and they submit their data through the portal. It's processed by the technology company and automatically submitted to to these reporting frameworks. Um, but while this is great, it saves property manager time. It reduces the costs on consultants. It um, it protects the property manager tenant relationship. You know, we don't we don't want to be chafing them with um, requests from property managers. There's a lot of value there, but it doesn't solve the coverage problem. So in scenarios where the tenant does not share the data or sign an LOA. That's a good uh, opportunity to install shadow metering, capture the data directly and, and submit it. So this hybrid approach, while you know, now that we see it fully laid out, appears more complicated, um, it's what we found the most cost-effective and kind of scalable policy um, for large and growing portfolios. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about um, the additional benefits of shadow metering. There are some portfolios that have said, um, we don't want the hybrid approach. We're going to go straight for shadow metering because we see um, we see the benefits of real-time 
tenant level data. Um, those benefits come primarily in two forms. And there, there are a few others, but I'll, I'll talk about the, the primary two today. First is tenant, tenant meter analytics. So the idea here is as the landlord, you can flip the script. Instead of saying, hey, tenant, uh, send us your data, you can say, actually, we have your data. And based off the real-time data, here are some opportunities for you, tenant, to save money. Um, one nice thing here is, you know, it's a value add. You can kind of market it in your leasing. Um, but it also is a way to justify cost sharing for the cost of shadow metering. So you can you can go to tenants and say, because this is an energy efficiency upgrade, um, we're gonna we're gonna work out cost sharing. Uh, maybe there's a green lease in place that has that spelled out. The other value here is with vacancy insights. So, um, you know, whenever a tenant moves out, whether they're directly metered or submetered or, or any scenario, uh, the landlord has to carry that utility cost for their space um, until until the next tenant moves in. Maybe that's just a couple months. Maybe it's a year. Who knows? Um, but when you add up the cost of those utilities for those vacant spaces um, across the portfolio, it's it's pretty significant uh, and can often pay for you know the cost of, of the shadow metering. So um, these vacancy insights basically saying, you know, this suite is consuming power when nobody's in it. Um, Turn, turn off the HVAC and the lighting and all the things in there um, can be a can be a significant source of value. And before I move on to the other topics, I want to provide a, a quick example here. So, um, multi-tenant industrial asset. It's in Utah, um, so that means it is in the green button coverage zone. There's a if you look it up. Um, Energy Star has a map of utilities that subscribe to Green Button. You can Google it and, and search your zip code and see if, see if it applies. This property had five tenants total. Um, four were private companies um, of various sizes and one publicly traded Fortune 500. These publicly traded five, Fortune 500s are more likely to deny <laughs> uh, requests for data. Maybe the smaller private ones um, will ignore requests. The, the big Fortune 500s are, are more likely to be protective of their data and just flat out deny it. So in this instance, uh, you know, the landlord worked with Entertive and um, in 60 days, we set up three LLAs and for the two tenants who uh, either denied or ignored the request, installed metering. And so within two months, we had 100% data coverage in this asset um, with this kind of hybrid approach. So um, just one example of what it actually looks like in, pra in practice and kind of the speed at which um, this can be set up. All right, changing topics entirely, moving on to maintenance and capital planning. Um, I kind of mentioned this before, but like the cost of capital it is slowing down deal volume, obviously, um, but it doesn't just affect acquisitions and dispositions um, for landlords who are who ultimately have to make capital investments into their portfolio, whether that's you know the roof or HVAC equipment or um, dock doors or whatever. Um, limiting the your exposure to a unexpected capex and and even forecasted. Uh, capital expenditures can make a significant difference. So again, we're gonna we're gonna start with what the conventional approach, based off what we hear kind of every day, is. Um, because the tenants are responsible for uh, maintaining equipment, the the best landlords can do is um, request uh, the maintenance contracts and reports from the tenants. So uh, um, 
individual results may vary, right? Uh, I think most portfolios acknowledge that some property managers are, are requesting this data on a regular basis, this information, uh, and others are not. Um, so the, the process generally looks like, you know, property manager maybe requests these contracts and these reports. The tenant maybe provides them. The, the property manager maybe like stores and organizes these PDFs in some like efficient way. Um, but the end result is almost always that like, um, you know, either the, either this is, this is not noticed until a tenant moves out and we, and we need to start billing them for, you know, the condition of, of the equipment that they left and the owner has to scramble to get this historical data or we're doing, you know, annual budgeting and, and capital planning and owner has to scramble to get the, the historical data anyway. Um, so this, this ties in closely to capital planning. Um, a similarly, you know, I guess I'll say archaic process usually starts with, you know, a third party property condition assessment. Asset management receives a 150 page PDF. They don't read any of it, but they take that like section where it, it, uh, it says what capital investments are going to be going to need to be made in the property uh, and what year they're going to need to be made and how much it's going to cost. And they transcribe that into a spreadsheet. Um, and that spreadsheet serves as kind of the, the budgeting spreadsheet um, for the property. Obviously, every single year that budget is reviewed. Um, property manager might come to asset management with um, things that they think might be needed to be invested in. Asset managers, usually just through their own kind of like intuition and experience, can gut check these costs and, and whether it's really needed. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I think many of you in the call just are finishing or just finished budgeting season and, and can relate to the, the scramble for historical data, especially if there's been any property manager or asset manager or facilities manager turnover. Um, that institutional knowledge is, is usually dependent on. Um, and <clears throat> while this like, this obviously is not great, it's not ideal. Um, it's how the biggest and best portfolios in the, in the country have been run and, and, and still are run today. So, uh, it's not necessary. It hasn't necessarily been like a deal breaker for the profitability of a, of a investment. However, Again, with the rising cost of capital, it's it's getting more attention, and and I'll talk about an example where, you know, if, if we if we look at at the value that can be created, um, it's like fixing this kind of not ideal process. Uh, it is is might be worthwhile. So that was the conventional approach, a more tech driven approach that you know, what we've seen out there is um, the technology company uh, starts with asset tagging. So the, the, they'll be responsible for going on site, um, basically taking pictures of all the equipment, uh, digitizing the nameplate information, getting that equipment useful life, um, deploying asset tags. So this all can be tracked in the field or, or in the cloud. And two things, one, set up tenant portals. The cool thing is that you know, if you combine this with the, the ESG reporting, it can be the same tenant portal through which they're submitting their utility bills. And you also digitize that that PCA. So it's it's no longer in a spreadsheet. It no longer has kind of those versioning issues and everything that comes along with Excel and spreadsheets. Two, uh, dual track here. One, tenants are prompted to upload the maintenance PDFs, very similar to the utility bills. So, you know, like... This is a kind of muscle memory thing with with the the uh, landlord tenant relationship and in industrial. It's you know it's it's an opportunity um, for a, a kind of frictionless touch point between the two. Um, and those maintenance contracts and those reports 
are maintained in the central database and visualized. So you can see across a property or across a portfolio, where do we not have contracts in place? Where, where are there gaps? Where do we need to kind of like push on tenants? Because when things are just stored in a, in a file drive, it's really hard to visualize um, where, where this data is missing. At the same time, property management uh, inspections are digitized. So at the end of the day, when it comes to annual budgeting decisions, you can make those decisions based off um, the preventative maintenance reports that tenants have submitted, as well as the you know, visual inspections that property managers have made throughout the year. Um, it's, it's not like you're not going to be able to get rid of half of, of your capital expenditure budget, but um, but there is value there, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, this this approach uh, works, and it's it's like a it's a software only approach, similar to that that like hybrid ESG approach. There is an opportunity to kind of take it to the next level. So you know you can see kind of your ten year capital plan in software for any given piece of equipment, um, manufacturer model, uh, expected useful life, the last preventive maintenance, warranties, all that can be stored with software. <clears throat> but at the same time, it in some cases, it might make sense to do equipment monitoring. So you can um, not only get maintenance contracts, but you can actually calculate the runtime hours of individual pieces of equipment and and get predictive analytics on its actual degradation. So the, the idea here is equipment useful life is based off manufacturer recommendations. Those are based off a lot of assumptions around how much the equipment's gonna be used. Um, the analogy is, you know, they don't, they don't tell you to get your tires rotated every six months, they tell you every 10,000 miles. Um, if we never had an odometer, we wouldn't know when we drove 10,000 miles. These runtime hours for individual pieces of equipment are the odometer um, giving property managers and asset managers insight on when equipment actually needs to be maintained, when it actually needs to be replaced based off how much it's actually run. So um, in many cases, this won't be applicable, but there may be some um, triple net lease properties where, where this does make sense and, and kind of pencils out from an ROI perspective. I wanna give a quick example here. Um, so it's happened this year uh, as a, a multi-tenant industrial asset in Massachusetts, um, the the five building assets. So, um, you know, one asset spread, spread amongst uh, five buildings. The all these processes were, were digitized in the spring of 2013. Um, going into, you know, according to the five-year capital plan, this asset had uh, $573,000 in CapEx budgeted. Um, based off the data that was collected, nearly $20,000 of that was, um, was confidently deferred. Uh, until future years. Now, um, obviously, out of a nearly six hundred thousand dollar budget, taking twenty thousand out is it's not going to change the game. But if you apply that across the portfolio, if you consistently deferred, you know, three point five percent of your capital costs, and this is this is all within one year. I, you know, with more data, you can potentially do this better. Um, that's significant savings, especially again, with the rising cost of capital. So um, more than pays for the, the software, but uh, also moves the needle when you look at it from you know, a portfolio perspective on, on capital costs. The, uh, the last topic I wanna touch here is tenant submetering. This is likely not going to apply for many industrial owners and operators on the call, but um, is we're seeing a lot of it uh, challenges for triple net retail properties, um, specifically water submetering. Uh, 
this stuff is is complicated, right? Like it is it's the bane of property managers' existence. They don't they don't get it. They don't want to deal with it. But it's expensive. Um, you know, this is nine thousand dollar water bill for one small property. Um, if that's not being recovered from tenants, it's a significant drag on the cash flow of the property. So how, how does the process usually work, right? Meters are read usually on clipboards, either by property managers or, or a third party. The utility bills are, you know, you log into the utility bill, the utility website, you pull down that, that PDF, you transcribe it, you combine these things into a billing spreadsheet, which is often overcomplicated, riddled with errors, send it to accounting, they generate the bills uh, and, and tenants get billed. At the end of the day, owner owners have no transparency into recovery. Um, you know, th this process is happening every single month or every single quarter. And many times landlords are footing the bill for uh, water consumption that their, their tenants are, are consuming just because the process is so manual and uh, riddled with errors. Better approach. Um, the meter reads are done via technology, whether it's manually on an app or with automated submeters. Utility bills are brought in automatically. They're, they're machine scraped, but human verified. The bills are generated by the software. Um, tenants are billed, accounting, sync happens automatically, and owners receive transparency and recovery. It's, um, you know, like if, if there's a suspicion that um, dollars are not being recovered from tenants on a on a uh, from a utility perspective, especially water, especially in retail, um, I don't think I've ever seen a scenario in which there wasn't significant increase in recovery when this process was digitized. Um, one small example of very recent, it's top of mind, open air retail. Uh, in Kansas City had six tenants. Um, they actually had no sub meters in place. Uh, they were trying to do pro rata billing, but it was, you know, they they were getting it wrong. Um, and basically they were they were covering like five percent of of what um, the actual water bill was. So 45 day water sub meter installed. It the technology here has improved a lot. I, you know, like water submetering is a very scary thought for a lot of owners and operators. Um, but there are there are new advances kind of on the hardware side that allow these things to be installed without hiring a plumber. It's like a very low cost, easy install these days. Um, in this in this asset, went from basically a thousand dollars a month to nineteen thousand dollars a month being recovered from tenants. Um, one of the tenants had even said. To the property manager, like, shouldn't we, shouldn't we be paying you guys for our water? Um, and now they are. <laughs> um, so, not applicable to a lot of industrial properties, but but really important, especially for for retail. Um, and these things do all tie together, right? Um, if you are uh, capturing utility bills to for billing purposes, there's no reason that data should not be submitted to Energy Star. Likewise, uh, if your submeters are manually read, there's that capital capital planning component of uh, planning to upgrade that metering infrastructure over time. Um, and then tying together kind of the capital plan and the, the you know, utility level uh, Energy Star reporting, putting together those decarbonization plans, making sure that when you do make capital investments, they are made with decarbonization and electrification in mind. So the while it seems like these pieces are disparate, they actually do tie together in, in significant ways, even for triple net portfolios that are that are not directly operating the buildings. And that's it. Uh, we're at 36 minutes since I started. Um, Feel free to ask questions. There's there's a QR code on your screen. 
Um, that will bring you directly to this white paper on the state of operational intelligence in triple net industrial. Um, no, uh, no form to fill out or anything. Um, so if you want to read that or if you want to share that with any colleagues, feel free to scan this. I'll, I'll leave this up on the, on the screen for a few minutes. My contact details are up here. Give me a call or shoot me an email anytime if you want to learn more or if you want advice or be pointed in the right direction. Um, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you for, thank you for joining. Um, we are looking forward to the next, uh, next Entertive Office Hours with all of you. Take it easy, everyone. Have a great Thursday and a great holiday season. And, uh, and we'll see you next time.